Hi, and welcome to the PATH Institute Virtual Summer Series. PATH Institute presents Boss Moves, Women Who Are Changing the Industry. I'm your host and moderator, J. Tasha St. Cyr, CEO and founder of Miss Everything Entertainment, a company that empowers women in front and behind the camera to produce and create entertainment for everyone. And I am honored to be sitting here with these lovely boss women. What do I mean by boss women? A lady who gets it done no matter what, whether it be at work, at home, in the office with coworkers, these ladies do it all. They're very strong, empowering leaders. So before I introduce our lovely panelists, I would first like to thank Executive Director Ayuku Babu and Asantawa Olatuni for their vision and fortitude of the Pan-African Film Festival for over 28 years. And at this moment, two years ago, we had the honor of having Chadwick Boseman at the Pan-African Film Festival. During this time, he was there to promote the film Black Panther, which he starred as Chatula. Rest in peace to Chadwick Boseman. Our condolences to his family, his friends, and his fans. Let's take a moment of silence and remember the great Chadwick Boseman. I would also like to thank Linda bronson Abbott for producing the PATH Institute Summer Series, where you can get firsthand information from experts. So once this panel is over, those of you who can and are willing, please visit PATH.org to donate so we can continue to bring free educational panels to our community. I would like to say welcome to those who are watching from YouTube, Facebook, and to be sure to drop any questions or comments that you have in the chat box, and we will be reading them off later. So let's meet our panelists. We have Leah Daniels Butler, casting director and producer and CEO of LDB Casting. We have Ricky Hughes, executive producer of Magic Lemonade Productions. We have Jamie Broadneck, editor in chief of Black Girl Nerds. And we have Connie Orlando, Executive Vice President, Specials Music Strategy at BET. Hello, ladies. Hi. 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 These boss women have accomplished so much from casting or interviewing over 100 of the world's most recognizable celebrities to executive producing the number one award show amongst African Americans. So let's go ahead and start with Leah Daniels Butler. Leo Daniels Butler began her career as a casting assistant almost 20 years ago, working with the legendary Jackie Brown and Kimberly Harden, where she assisted in casting stars such as Tyrese Gibson in the Coca-Cola ad, which launched his career. Climbing the casting ladder, Leah assisted on films like CB4 starring Chris Rock, The Inkwell with Lorenz Tate, and the classic Friday starring Ice Cube and Chris Tucker. Leah became recognized amongst black filmmakers and the mainstream television space for her work ethic and reputation for getting the job done. I told you she was a boss lady. <laughs> Leah started LDB Casting, a successful company she owns and operates today. As an independent casting director, she worked across genres, securing talent for films like Too Fast and Too Furious, ATL, Shadow Boxer, and many more. In 2013, Leah casted award-winning film, The Butler, that was directed by her brother, congratulations, <laughs> with another all-star lineup that include Oprah, Forrest Whitaker, Robin Williams, and many more. So Leah, you have also casted Empire and All-American, which you guys just saw a clip of. Can you let us know how you got started in your career and the path you took to get to us today? Wow. Um... I started so long ago and um, thank goodness for, you know, black women that um, weren't afraid to 
um, embrace me and share their shine. Do you know what I mean? Um, I stand on the shoulders of Jackie Brown Carmen, or actually Jackie Brown and Kim. And um, they were just very, they saw something in me at a 26 years old that I actually didn't even see in myself. Um, I was just young, young girl from Philadelphia and I wanted to, um, I knew I wanted something better for myself. I just didn't know exactly what that was. And I know at 26, especially now you see the kids today and they have it all figured out, but I was one of those people that did not have it figured out. And, um, and they just guided me along. And so I'm very fortunate and blessed to have those two women in my life and um, to introduce me to casting and allowing me to just be a fly on the wall and a sponge in the room and learn as much as I could um, from them to basically parlay that to the career that I have right now. Amazing. Well, you are a boss woman and we are so glad to have you here on this panel. Thank you. Um, let me go ahead and uh, introduce our next panelist that we have. Next, I have Grammy and Emmy Award producer, Ricky Hugh. She's the CEO of Magic Lemonade Productions. She really turned her lemons into lemonade. Ricky Hughes runs an award-winning company, Magic Lemonade Productions, founded in 2014. The Emmy and Multi Grammy Award-winning company is widely credited with projects such as, such as Dave Chappelle's special, on Netflix, Hood Adjacent with James Davis, and also continued to innovate with the HBO All Deaf Comedy Special, The Ultimate Became a Series. Magic Lemonade's programming also includes The Mind of EP, Roast of Snoop Dogg, The Next Big Thing, ABF Honors. Ricky Hughes also serves on the diversity community for the Producer Guild of America. So Ricky, why did you start Magic Production Lemonade and what exactly does Magic Production Lemonade do for the industry? Thanks for having me. So Magic Lemonade was created out of, I just wanted to create shows that really protected the voice and that's always been my cause. So from uh, early on, we had like even like DC Young Fly and 85 South and you know, Emmanuel Hudson, these were all voices that I believed in six, seven years ago. We were just fighting just to push them into the mainstream for people to just kind of get it and no one wanted to do it. And I said, hey, let's just do it ourselves. And so early on, we realized that we had to create our own if we wanted to have our own voice. And so everything I've done has been that. So Magic Lemonade was created for that very reason. Um, Magic Lemonade means, you know, uh, the way the, the um, the way the name of the company came along was I realized that all these projects I would get, like sometimes they, you know, I would be given lemons. And I was like, all we have to do is add a little bit of magic and we will have lemonade at the end. So I've been really excited to have all what I call my magicians, all the great staff and crew that work with me because I can't do it alone. And you can't say it without smiling. Amazing. Oh my gosh, you are definitely a lead for all these young women coming up in the industry. We also have Editor-in-Chief Jamie Brodnex. Jamie is the founder and CEO of online publication Black Girl Nerds. Jamie graduated with a master's degree in film and a bachelor's of science in broadcast journalism. She is the executive producer of their BGN podcast, that's Black Girl Nerds podcast and is known for her social media presence on Twitter as Black Girl Nerds. She was covered some of the greatest entertainers to Oprah Winfrey. Jamie has written for Variety, Hollywood Reporter, The New York Post, Huffington Post. The list goes on, Jamie. I don't know how you write, but it is amazing. And I am so glad that we have you here, the CEO and founder of Black Girl Nerds. Can you tell us how you got started writing for these known publications? Yeah, um, it actually started by creating my own website. Um, and that started by me doing a Google search one day and typing in Black Girl Nerds and nothing came up. So I was like, OK, we're unicorns. We don't exist, apparently. <laughs> and um, when that didn't come up in the Google search engine, the largest search engine in the world, um, I decided to create a blog site of that same name and uh, it, it grew exponentially. 
And uh, a lot of young women really found themselves in this website. And as the website grew, uh, uh, people started noticing it. And by people, not only people within the black community, black women, but um, studios started recognizing it. Celebrities started recognizing it. Um, and during the time I was uh, writing for Black Girl Nerds and creating this blog, um, I was trying to freelance for other websites and time and time again, they would reject me. And it wasn't until yeah. I created my own blog site that, you know, those big publications were like, oh, can you write this piece? Can you write that? So, um, you know, kind of that thing where, you know, not necessarily asking for a seat at the table, but, you know, kind of creating your own and then people will come to you. That, that's essentially what happened. How long have you been, uh, or when did you start creating Black Girl Nerds? Like how long has it been that it's been in existence? Yeah, February 1st of 2012 was when I launched the website. So it's um, been a long time now. And, uh, you know, it's been a really great ride during this time. It was really just a blog about me and my personal musings about geek culture. And uh, when people started recognizing it for being something even bigger than that, um, especially when big studios and, and uh, celebrities started retweeting our content on Twitter, um, I realized this is a news publication. This is an online entertainment hub. Um, and then I really started taking it seriously and treating this like a business. I, you know, for the first several years, in fact, of Black Girl Nerds, I didn't treat it like a business, I treated it like a blog. So um, yeah, eventually I took it seriously and made it what it is now. Well, thank you so much. And last but not least, our special guest finalist, panelist, sorry, is Constant Orlando, which is Connie Orlando, who recently served as executive vice president and head of programming at Black Entertainment Television, BET, with oversights on all genres of original programming as a re-owned award-winning media executive Connie Orlando has risen and became the highest ranking and most treasured black woman at any TV network. And she just got started, you guys. Orlando is credited with leading and evaluating BET's original programming strategy for the past three years. The network currently holds four of the top six spots for a new scripted program among African-Americans with the hit series, Games People Play, American Soul, and Boomerang and the new series, 20s, and the Uptown Record Story, which will premiere in 2020. Can you give us a little bit about that that's coming in 2020? We gotta wait. Yeah, it should say 2021. <laughs> oh, 2021, the pandemic. Uh, her leadership and vision resulted in major milestones, including the Bobby Brown story, Black Girls Rock, being Mary Jane and BET presents Love and Happiness and Obama Celebration, Sunday Best, and scripted series The Game, which she scored record breaking ratings. Thank you so much, Connie, for being here. We are so happy to have you here. Can you let us know how you got started in your career and the path you took to get to where you are today? <laughs> it's so funny. Um, thank you for having me. And my path has taken a lot of turns. So I was a finance major in school. And after, after college, I was a senior expense analyst at Chase for a year. And on the weekends, I would, um, what would I do? I'd PA on music videos because I had friends that wanted to be music video directors. Um, and that kind of opened me into production and producing. Um, I worked and ran Hype Williams' Big Dog Films years ago for about seven years, where we did some of the biggest and best music videos. Um, I then uh, went into TV as a freelance producer uh, for BET and for other production companies. I started my own production company that did Jay-Z Streets is Watching. Um, and then I landed the VP of development job at uh, BET. And I've been there for 13 years in a variety of positions that from vice president of development to vice president of original programming to SVP of specials to EVP and head of programming, and now in this new role, um, EVP of specials, music programming, and strategy. Amazing. 
I want to say thank you all to all the panelists that we have here. Um, I do want to know uh, to all of our panelists, when was your first at the festival? Have you guys visited the Pan African Film Festival before? Of course. Absolutely. Connie, can you tell us about your experience at the Pan African Film Festival? Oh, I've always had a great time uh, at uh, PFF. Uh, we used to be big sponsors. Um, you always, the talent you come across, the the movies, like it's always very insightful and, and you meet great folks to network with and uh, great talent uh, as you consider people for the network. And uh, Leah, I know you casted a lot of actors. Has any of your actors have films at the Pan African Film Festival? I don't know if they currently um, have uh, film in the film festival now, but I do know that there have been a lot of the actors that I've cast, obviously um, a large part of the projects that I have cast are black projects. So, um, and, and, and now with uh, actors segueing into their own production companies and producing their own content, um, and, 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 and putting it out there, I'm sure um, Pan-African Film Festival has been very kind and generous to them uh, to allow them to screen their films there. Amazing. Well, I just wanted to let everybody know that in 2021, the Pan-African Film Festival will be virtual. So everyone should be there next year. It will be February, 2021. So let's get started to why we're here, Boss Moves and these Boss Women. What inspires you women to create your own company, to be bosses, and to mentor and lead other African-American women below you? Jamie, can you go ahead and add to that? Oh, wow. Um, I think what inspires me, boss, I mean, I'll be honest with you. It, it was a journey. You know, I, I didn't quite know that I was a boss yet. And um, that is something that that I'm, I'm honestly working through in the process of building my business. Um, but it's been very rewarding, uh, the journey that I've had with Black Girl Nerds, because I've seen some of the women that I currently work with and even some of the women that um, have gone on uh, that have worked with me in the past have some really great opportunities in film that have worked on to work with bigger publications or to work with studios and, and big corporate entertainment companies. Um, so it's great that Black Girl Nerds has become a launching pad uh, for opportunities in entertainment journalism. And I'm grateful that you know BGN has uh, been able to be that platform for Black women. It is definitely a platform for Black women. Um, Black girl nerds, there's a lot of nerds. I actually was one. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I do follow everything that you guys do. And Ricky, um, you started Magic Lemonade and you have Grammy Award, Emmy Award for all your comedy specials. How is that, you know, teaching other women under you how to become, you know, executive producer of such things like these? I mean, it's been very important. I mean, I didn't have any footsteps to step into as a black female showrunner, especially within comedy. I came from the music industry. So I feel like I've always had um, an affinity for music and, and comedy, I always find its way into my world. And so it's been important. I mean, I'm excited to say that every assistant that's come, that sat on my desk is now a producer that I actively hire. Like they, you know, they've, soared and I'm so excited for them. And it's it's my job. It's part of my job. I mean, there's literally uh, moments in our day that we just dedicated just to make sure that I take new calls, new business, new people. Like we separate that time out every week where I don't set meetings just so I can talk to new people who want to intern or get a new chance or have their first break. You know, it's important. And how important was it for Connie that you had somebody that you looked up to or mentor to? You know, it's funny when I first started coming up um, and I think why like I'm so inspired and why I, uh, it's important for me to, to help young women because I didn't have a lot of women. There were, there were not a lot of women that I could look up to in my field. And I, th I didn't have the benefit of hearing about journeys and and just someone to bounce things off of. 
in that way. So I try, like Ricky, to really um, like do informationals. I used to do our little lady lunches uh, at the office just to provide like convening space where you can talk, talk openly and just really talk about journeys. And everybody's journey is different, but it's always good to hear how somebody got there. Definitely. You, it's not a traditional path that everyone goes down and you ladies are a prime example of the different path you took to become where you guys are. So thank you for sharing these stories. Um, Leah, in entertainment, do you feel that males are more dominant than women in the entertainment industry? I mean, I think there was, um, yes, to answer the, the, the short question, um, to answer the question just direct head on, yes. But I do feel like women are definitely making, making more strides. Um, you have more female directors, you have more female showrunners, executive producers, creators. Um, there's so women just in general are really just um, making strides in the entertainment industry. And um, I was on a, um, a call just the other day, a meeting um, for a project, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. nothing but women on the call. I mean, all, you know, Black, white, Asian, Latino, and I was expecting a, a man to jump on, but it was that was it. It was just, oh my, okay, it's a party, and I was just really excited. And I got, thank you know, I'm thankful for that, but I'm just more thankful to be working with such a talented group of women, and um, and and yeah, and just making boss moves. And Ricky, um, I mean, you work with a lot of males, especially in the comedy series or comedy shows. Is there more women now than it was when you first started? For sure, absolutely. Um, but I was, like I have to say, I've had a great trajectory. I mean, I came, I mean, I came from hip hop, so I worked with all men there and I never had any problems there. It never, you know, stifled my career at all. And then when I moved over to film and TV, you know, I was graciously welcomed in with some really great guys, you know, Stan Lathan and Ralph Farquhar and Carl Craig, where they welcomed me into production effortlessly. And, you know, I was a new mom. I had just gotten divorced. Like I had a lot of things happening in my life and they were just welcoming as a woman and I didn't feel any different. I mean, the workload wasn't any different. They didn't treat me any different. More than anything, I felt, you know, really respected throughout the process and they walked me through a lot of, you know, new new ventures and new genres that we all went through together. So I'm excited and, you know, I'm excited that it's more women in the field now, but I honestly say I, you know, I came up with guys. <laughs> Did you have any female mentors or were they all male mentors when you were coming up, Ricky? I really wish I did. I really wish I had just a black woman or even a woman. You know, my my mentor was, believe it or not, was Sharon Osborne, and I distributed her oh. labels XUS. So Sharon was probably one of the biggest mentors in my life, and she just told me, "Go for it, Ricky. It has nothing to do with what other people think. It's exactly what you think." She's like, "Before you walk into a meeting, know exactly what you want out of the meeting, because otherwise, someone else will get exactly what they want." She told me I when I first met her, I wore big baggy sweats all the time because I worked around all men. So I wanted them to respect me and not see me. She said, that's not your issue. That's theirs. She said, you walk into that meeting, mm -hmm. you know what you want and you get out of there. She's like, and that's it. She showed me balance with work life, family, understanding. I remember we were in a meeting and we were sitting here with the heads of all of the um, all the distributed labels for all of Europe and it's all men and we're the only two women and the phone rings and it's ozzy and she stops the meeting she picks up the phone she's like yes ozzy yes the remote is on the side of the bed yes she's like okay no problem <laughs> hangs up walks back to the meeting mm -hmm. she gets to the phone rings again she gets up she walks she's talks she's like yes kelly yes yes i know you want to go to um to the, sit outside for tickets you know your dad can get you free tickets i know you want to do it with your friends go ahead you have permission and she sat back down and finished the meeting and she told me, she said, Ricky, it's important that every person in this room knows what's mm -hmm. important for you. She's like, more than anything, it lets my family know that they're important. 
And that was really big for me because I always put everything on the back burner. Like as a woman, I have to work harder. I have to put my career first in every move. And I do, but my family still knows that if you need me, I'm here and nothing is going to be more important than that. And I think that's really important because it's easy and I, it's easy to lose work-life balance. And how, how um, it ve is very easy to lose work-life balance. Leah, I know you've been married for over 25 years now. Yes, 25. Tw oh, 25 years, congratulations. Um, how is their work-life balance with balancing, you know, being a mom, having a husband and leading a whole casting agency? You know, I had kids very young, so um, probably too young to, to start having kids, to be honest with you. I, I, my first kid was 18 and then the second was 20. And then when my husband and I um, were married, he had uh, three boys and so we merged our families. And so we have five children and they're all adult children now. The youngest is 26. And, um, and it was hard. I think we were both young and we were both, um, you know, just burgeoning in our career. So I think we, um, probably did a lot of things wrong as parents <laughs> because we was just young trying to figure it out. You know what I mean? Like we, there's no handbook to being a parent. I think you just figure it out as you go along. And uh, now that I have grandchildren, I'm probably a much better grandmother than I was um, a young mother. But um, I say that to say that uh, it, it, it was definitely hard balancing because at the time I was um, a casting uh, director at Warner Brothers was uh, a record executive at Loud Records. And we, you know, both had very uh, demanding jobs. And we, with five kids in the house, with our demanding careers, it was important that um, we made time for not just the kids and time for ourselves, but also balanced out our career. It, it's difficult, I'm not gonna lie. And, and I came into this game as a single parent um, until I met my husband and it was even harder then. Um, but I think when you have a, a clear path of what it is that you wanna do, you figure it out. I think black women in general are just strong women, just strong, you know? We don't, mm -hmm. we don't think about what needs to be done, we just do it. And then you're like, after it's done, you're like, oh, how did I even do that? <laughs> Where was it all coming from? Um, so yeah, I hope I answered the question. You did, you did. Um, Jamie, how do you balance, you know, being in front of the camera, interviewing the likes of like Oprah and all these celebrities and also running your whole blog page with all your staff of chief and like, how do you balance that? Being in front and behind the camera? Yeah, I mean, I'm blessed. I, I have a team, an incredibly talented team of freelancers that handle the bulk of that work for me. So I have on-camera journalists, I have podcasters, I have freelance writers, and um, I get to kind of be behind the scenes now and do a lot of the work of what an editor-in-chief actually does. And I don't do a lot of the, you know, in front of the camera work like I used to. Um, to the point where, you know, I used to pretty much uh, extend the bandwidth of my life and just overexert myself. Um, so now I um, really handle the business of Black Girl Nerds and find ways to earn more revenue and build this thing to scale and um, really be able to bring in more writers and bring in more staff, um, which is great because the city is building and the business is building. And that's essentially, you know, what you want to do when you are building a company. Um, so I'm glad that I've been able to juggle that because I've been able to get more sleep. <laughs> I've been able to practice more self-care. And um, I, I really wasn't able to do that, you know, the first few years of, of running the business because it was essentially, you know, I was kind of doing a lot. I was doing it all. and. Um, they say, you know, you know, you you can do it all, but you you shouldn't do it all. Um, you really should try to delegate and give opportunities to other folks that can help you out. And that was something that I wasn't doing. And um, I'm glad that now I have a team of folks that can really help build this with me. 
Um, so yeah, yeah, they're they're doing all of the the junkets and all of the fun, entertaining stuff, and um, you know I get to do all of the fun uh, admin stuff behind the scenes, which is great because it's it's actually ma making this a sauce. Well, I know. Speaking of teens, I know Connie has a huge team over at BET. So how is it one with you know, managing your team and being a female, because I know a lot of males have difficulties with, you know, respecting a lady in charge. So how do you handle when you come across these trials and tribulations? You know what? I've been very, I mean, I'm blessed. I don't really have those, those type of issues. I have a big team and I think, you know, I've learned in the last, what, I would say the last three years to really lean on them and, mm -hmm. and, you know, we talked about balance and like, I think in the last year and a half, when I leave work at six, if we're not in active production, like I turn it off, I take weekends. And last year was the first year in my career that I was able to take vacation. I took all my vacation time. And um, mm -hmm. uh, this is the question you asked before, by the way, but to answer the question that you just asked, uh, <laughs> About how to balance the time, but I don't like our environment is just very like we're all family. We all we respect each other's ideas. It's not like I don't like to come across as oh you're the boss and what you say because sometimes I could be wrong. And I think in creative environments you really have to hear everybody's voice. And I think that's how you know I like for my team to approach everything. Like we have open communication. We have brainstorming sessions. You know everyone every idea. There's no silly question. Like, and I think that's how you, with that kind of collaboration, that's how you really, you know, come up with those great ideas that, that move, you know, the company forward. Amazing, amazing. I mean, you definitely have to keep moving forward. And uh, speaking of working over there in your big team, do you have a lot of like African-American women? Like what is the basis that BET strives on when they're hiring someone and, and looking for people to work in their career? Well, we, we always look for the best and <laughs> the people who can do the work and want to do the work and want to add to the work. Um, I'm very fortunate at BET. I work with people who look like me every day for the last 13 years. So, you know, I don't have to show up and be the black woman in the room. I'm just the woman in the room. And I think in that kind of environment, it's very, you know, it's very healthy in, in seeing yourself in different roles and opportunities. Um, so that's one of the perks of being at BET. Um, and we always, I think at the end of the day, you always want the best person for the job, but you also want to uh, look at people who may have potential. Like sometimes you can see it, it may not be there, you know, but you can grow it. Um, so we just look for people who are passionate about, you know, black imagery, uh, telling stories and, you know, in the culture. BET has been very kind to me in the past. I'll say that. I've passed quite a few shows. So thank you. We love you. And we family too. And I'm glad that you guys were able to work with each other. How important is it for us as African American to work with each other, especially women, because a lot of men or, you know, of other ethnicities don't really look at us as you know, leaders or they look at us as angry black women, like how's it important for us to like change the narrative and then work with each other? Ricky, do you have something so to say on that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I look, I think it's great for us to continue to work with, it is important, I think, to even work with people that aren't just black women, because that's the only way you can change the narrative. I mean, I feel like I've been able to work with black women easily with without any problems, but it is important for me to reach across the aisle and have and build some of those other relationships as well. It, it's just important. Yeah. I agree. Well, like, Jamie, I think... No, but I just oh, want no, to add I... to that. Like... Oops, sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, I was no, just going to add to that. Super important that we just support each other as women. And the world is not, you know, you have to work with everybody. Um, but I think once when, you know, you have your team and your 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 girl team behind you, like it just pushes you forward. And I think we all support and run things by each other. And, and that's how we become stronger in the workplace. 
I definitely just want to agree with that. Yeah, we, we have to support each other. I mean, all we have is us. So we see what's happening in the world right now and um, we need each other more now than ever. So we, we have to support each other. That's the only way that we can thrive, that we can survive. Um, so really have to you know, stop with the crap in the bucket mentality and just align and empower each other and realize that this is an even playing field and we're all in this together. Um, so let's just empower each other as women. Um, Cause that's, you know, that's the way we can do it. Um, well, speaking of the crab and the barrel mentality, Leah, I know when you are looking for jobs or working for jobs or, you know, casting certain projects, do you ever come across, um, do you ever come across directors or, producers not wanting to hire you because of who you are, because you're African-American woman? Or do they look to hire you because you are African-American woman? How, how does the industry work with you? It, listen, I mean, I have been uh, a part of sort of, I'm not gonna, you know, okay, so here's the thing. There's like boxes that need to be checked when you are, um, when you're, I think, going up for certain jobs because you know there's a diversity, um, uh, a diversity thing that needs to be uh, sort of addressed when you're being hired for certain projects. But what I think is a little frustrating is when you know that it's just a service. Like you know, I know when I'm just having this meeting because I'm a part of something that needs to be done. Um, now, when I'm really being mm. considered, then it's different. You know what I mean? And I have been in both positions. I have been in positions where, like, I know 100 percent that um, that there were other black casting directors that were just maybe, you know, that were as qualified, if not more, than I was. But then that job may have went to a white counterpart, and it may have been even a black project. And I think that's probably one of the most, I don't even know if I'm going off on a tangent about something that you didn't even ask, but I have to say it because we're, we're talking about it. But um, but I, I it, it's frustrating when you are, when you know that there's only a small group of you anyway. As black casting directors, there's probably only about six or seven of us that work actively um, or regularly in, the entertainment business. Now, here's the thing: there's a lot of us, but I think there's a core group that really work the most. And um, when one of them get, gets a job or works, you know, on a project that um, that we may have all met on, I'm genuinely happy because I feel like, you know, what I'm just glad that that went to another black casting director and um, not mm -hmm. um, uh, a non-black especially if they're telling our story. You know, when I look at um, like Black Panther and when I look at um, even more recently, um, uh, uh, Daniel Kalua is in is it Judah and the Black Messiah. And I'm like, I was called for that project, you know, my availability to check. Um, and I never got a meeting. I remember calling back, hey, um, I, you know, if this is something, this is, if you guys have any decision, I would love to meet on it. And it's, oh, no, we went another direction. And I thought, okay, probably Victoria Thomas or Kim Coleman got it or Kim Hardy. You know, one of my other counterparts that literally there's like a handful of us that work. And so I said, well, one of them probably got it. And then when the trailer dropped and I saw it, I immediately went to who cast it. And I saw that it was Alexa Folger. And that hurt my heart. And not because she mm. couldn't do it, but because this is a story about one of the most prominent Black Panther Party members, and nobody thought that a Black casting director, and I'm sorry I'm getting emotional, but it makes me emotional when these stories are told and we're not a party, you know? Anyway. Right. No, we definitely no, touched on emotional. something. Get emotional. Stay like, emotional. Because <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's serious. Emotional. I've, had, I've had the fights in that and, you know, mm -hmm. and been on shows where you know, we've had some really great shows. And in the end, there's a show I didn't even finish. And they brought on, 
you know, a 65 year old Jewish man to tell the middle class black male story. And we have great show in the can and what came out, I, you know, I wasn't proud of. And I had right. a real clear conversation. They did a show called Black Girl Magic without a black woman in the writing room, without a black woman at the show. It's a problem for me. Absolutely. Jamie, how, is import how important is it that you are, you know, editor in chief and you're writing to, to know that these stories are coming from African Americans that are told about African Americans? I don't know how much of your freelancers that work with you, uh, the percentage of your company is African American, but um, can you touch on like making sure that stories are told from us, by us, and for us? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's like ninety eight percent of us <laughs> that are African American. Um, you know, I I appreciate when um, you know, for example. Universal Pictures invited us out to a set visit for Queen and Slim, and it was all black press um, on the set visit. Um, so that is rare because I've been on set visits for other black films and I was the only black person there. <laughs> so uh, it's important that there are films that uh, do have, that are written through the lens of a black journalist uh, because First and foremost, there's not many of us out there telling the story, um, but also, you know, we really need to have access to these opportunities uh, to tell these stories. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that it goes, the same situation goes in journalism, um, the same situation goes to access in journalism when it comes to interviews you know on the red carpet and you know we've seen those conversations and heard those conversations before as well um because uh, you know that that is a problem when it comes to uh talking to some of these celebrities and i'm not trying to call out any names here but sometimes when you're trying to talk to a black celebrity and there is a publicist and sometimes their publicist is not a publicist of color that publicist will not let you talk to them. Um, mm. So they'll, and then you get put into what we call the journalists called the Rosa Parks section of the press line, um, where we don't even get a chance to speak to them at all and they just rush past us. So, you know, some of these things need to be scrutinized and, and, and looked at when it comes to the system. Of, of Hollywood and the system of journalism and when it comes to access to journalists, because we are there and we, we get a chance to be out there, but are we giving the, are we being given the proper access that we need to tell these stories? Because uh, keep in mind, you know, there's not many of us that have these public, have these publications, have these owned publications, no less, that are continually mm -hmm. telling these kinds of stories. Um, so when we get the off chance to be able to go on carpet, to go on a set visit, to go on a press junket, you know, give us the solid to be able to do a one on one with some of these uh, uh, these talent, uh, these celebrities, uh, these stars of some of these shows, because that that content on our site holds a lot of value. And that that's something that uh, means a lot to our publications that we run those kind of stories. Right, and the as you guys all, like the tide is changing. No, I was just gonna yes. say, I think the tide has changed. You know, like I feel like we have more opportunity right now than we probably ever have, and I feel like as you know, as women of color, now that these doors are open, I think it's really important for us to step through, and not just step through, but then deliver quality projects once we get mm -hmm. through that door, because when the door, I don't know how long the window's gonna be open and it might not be long, but as long as it's open, I think it's important that we really create, like right now, I'm show running a show on ABC with Michelle Obama, all while I'm also doing another mm -hmm. project with Will Smith with HBO. Like that might not have happened before, right. you know? And I, so I know it's important that while I have this opportunity that I put my best foot forward and really put some great content on that screen. And that's what will keep us in the door, right. even if it closes. Right. And as you Absolutely. all mentioned, making sure the content and everything comes from, you know, black people and in front and behind the camera. We all know that BET 
black entertainment television definitely created that lane because we were pushed out from all these areas of all these other shows. So Connie, can you tell us like the start of BT and how important is it for you to, you know, put programs and shows and entertainment that is for us and by us and create it? Absolutely. And I always say like, uh, in this, everything that's going on now, you know, we knew 40 years ago that, you know, black content and creators were important and had amazing, uh, things to offer again, like it's a big perk. Like I get to work, uh, in an environment that strictly like we do content for our, our culture, for African-Americans, for people who love black culture. And we get to walk authentically in that, um, it's so important that, you know, when people criticize BET, I was like, well, what does a world without BET look like? And, you know, and that's a scary world where you don't have something that is real and true and you're not controlling, you know, you know, the images and what people see. I think a lot of what we do just widens the aperture about, you know, black people, we're not a monolith. We try to tell as many stories, you know, we don't just tell that one story that may, <laughs> that may be popular at the time, there's different POVs and different ways to attack it and, you know, different ways to entertain. Like uh, BET was at the forefront because there was no, like they wouldn't play music videos on other channels. They, you know, there were no outlet and we created our own. And I think that's why BET is home for so many folks. Um, I think people go away and they mm -hmm. become big stars. They always come back because it's so important to kind of build home. And this is the place where, you know, you feel safe this is the place where you know you'll see yourself reflected in the right way. And this is the, the way you'll see many stories that, that you wanna hear and see um, that, that talk to you and your families and your, your children. Connie, have you ever got any stories or shows that was not uh, presented by an African-American but it was about African-American uh, uh, culture? Did you get any stories like that? And how did you, I know, I know we, BT want to stay true and home to, you know, authenticity. So can you tap on that a little bit more? I mean, we get pictures from everywhere, but any show that we mm -hmm. decide to forward with, whether it's a special or, you know, at the helm or in the writing room, we make sure that it is the right people can tell that story and represent that story. Like lots of opportunities. And the great thing about that BT is that we've given huge opportunities to to people that look like us to to get into the industry. I think like we're in this moment where everyone's like writing a check for diversity, but it really begins with, you know, one, hiring at all levels and pay equity. But the other part of it is really creating these things and these these spaces to bring people into the industry, whether it's to intern or to work or to learn. Like we gotta kinda have to kind of create the paths too because I think that's where we're, where we're, um, where we're lacking. I said I love going to the PFF Film Festival because there's a lot of talent there, there's a lot of writers, there's a lot of actors, there's a lot of directors, there's a lot of producers there that don't have agents, but they're super talented. And that's where it's our responsibility to also always bring up that next generation that might not be seen, that might not have an agent, that might, you might not meet you know, in your day to day. So I'm very intentional about that. And BET has always been very intentional about that too, with music artists. Like we love the mm -hmm. emerging art. We love to give, you know, voices to people and chances. And we've taken some, some big swings that have paid off with some of the superstars that in music today, um, as well as writers and showrunners and actors. So I'm very proud of what we do here at BET. Amazing. Well, we are proud, you know, to have a, a place to call home. And that's PATH. We've been around for 29 years now and BET even longer. Um, so, you know, these are homes for a lot of African-American uh, people in the industry. So, Leah, I did have a question that I, I, I saw come from the audience. What was like your biggest hurdle from becoming a casting agent, uh, casting assistant to a casting director to owning your own company? Um. One of the biggest hurdles I think was transitioning from associate to casting director. Um, because as an associate, obviously you work 
with casting directors and you're sort of their their right hand. And I think sometimes you can get stuck in that sort of um, in that in that position. And it's not like a bad position to be in. I think that the thing is is that producers and uh, other creators may look at it, oh, well, you're an associate, you're like above an assistant um, and not necessarily a casting director. Um, and, and I think the biggest hurdle was trying to get uh, the producers to understand that casting associates, it's just like if you had a lawyer um, and you know it's this company and associates, they're all lawyers. They're just, um, some have you know probably a little more experience than others. So I think the, the biggest transition for me was helping people to truly understand that the associate, um, even though we're on an associate level, we're still casting directors. Um, so there's that. I think in terms of one of the biggest hurdles in starting my own company was uh, at, when I left Warner Brothers, um, and thank God for, you know, my experience at Warner Brothers because I was, I transitioned, I went there as an assistant. However, I was an associate and stepped into the assistant position when I went there um, only because they didn't have an associate program. But when I first, um, when I think I was there for two years as an assistant, I worked under Leslie Litt. Um, and uh, was that the show you worked on the Wayne Brothers with? That well, show? that was. Yeah, well, prior to that, she was she worked on Friends. Um, the very first show we did was with Robert Townsend and oh my gosh, Regan Gomez Preston. I can't think of the title, but um, that was on the WB. I think it was called at the time. And um, when we when she hired me to be her assistant, obviously she wanted a black assistant because she wanted someone that knew black talent. Um, and I respect her for that because you know you have a lot of white casting directors who will just go out there and 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 do it and not necessarily um, embrace someone of that culture that knows that culture that can really help and assist you with it. So I applaud her for um, for bringing me on for that. But I think even in addition to that, I was able to help Warner Brothers create an associate program because I was going to leave after two years because I just didn't feel any growth. I know I couldn't go from the assistant to a casting director there. Um, I had already stepped in as um, I took a step, a seat back when I first got there because I was already an associate. But you know, I'm, I'm like, okay, I'm getting married. I need insurance. I need a 401k. I started thinking about real life issues, and so I, I did that. And in doing that, they recognized how valuable I was, so they created this associates program. Um, and I was promoted to an associate. And then a year after that, I was promoted to a casting director. So um, it was it was only after that that okay, now I'm at that level. And unfortunately, when you know Time Warner and um, and, and Warner Brothers merged, or before they were Time Warner, it was uh, something else. I can't think of the name. But before they merged, um, they had dissolved the entire casting department, and they were like maybe 17 casting directors that were on staff there and under the tutelage of uh, Barbara Miller. And she, um, you know, she passed away, God rest her soul, but she gave me the opportunity to not just be an assistant, to, to create an associate's program and then promote me to a casting director, which initially helped me launch my um, own company, LDB Casting, in 2001. So you launched your company in 2001. Ricky, when did you launch uh, Magic Lemonade Productions? How far in your career? I can't hear her. We can't hear you, um, Ricky. You Can wanna you double check? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. So Magic Lemonade started in 2014. Um, I already had another company, um, Completely Three, that started in 2001. So mm -hmm. I had already, you know, owned my own company. And, you know, to um, Leah's point, you know, even when I started working with um, with John Cosette, rest his soul, you know, I was the first black woman to ever have a position of producer and especially showrunner for him. But one thing, you know, he did a lot of uh, shows with BET and, you know, he knew it was important that, you know, we were there, that we were the voice that, you know, 
that he had that representation there and he was respectful of it. It wasn't, we didn't feel like this is the token person thrown in there because it was a black network. We felt like mm -hmm. he really valued our opinion. So what was a defining moment that you, that changed you to become this boss of your company? Like what defined, like, were you not being respected when you were getting on set and you were like, well, I'm going to create my own production or was it like, it was like, people already was following under you and you were just, let me just go ahead and form Magic Lemonade. Well, two things. One, I realized that I was building other people's company for them and we, and mm -hmm. our, um, our goals were not aligned. Like I choose to have ownership in the, in the projects that I work on and it was important for me. And, um, you know, it's nice to help people build their company, but then it's also nice to have your own company. And I love it. I hire the people I want, the culture around everyone that we work with. They love working with the company. They are family more than they are employees. And all of those things are really important to me that they all come back. I know in a jam, they'll hunt for me. They'll get it done. They'll fight for me. And for me, that's important because I'll do the same thing for them. And Connie, was there any hurdles or trials and tribulations that you went along your ladder up to executive vice president of BET? Um, absolutely. I mean, there's always hurdles and, and you know, it comes with, with any, in any, any industry, with any job. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have been elevated in my career at BET, but all that comes with, you know, I get a report card every day. <laughs> so for every show, uh, I am judged on immediately. And, you know, not all of them, you know, are great, you know, but I think that's just part of the business. I think our failures or our things that we don't do well at teach us something and we move it forward. So, you know, with the hurdles um, has have come great victories and you just try to take the lessons from all and just move them forward. And last but not least, Jamie, did you have any hurdles uh, with, you know, starting your own company, Black Girl Nerds? Was there any hurdles you had to face? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think hurdles, obviously, for everybody goes with the territory of running your own business. And I've definitely had um, a few, um, some pretty big ones, definitely. Um, and within the last couple of years, it's been pretty rough. But I'll say this, that, you know, uh, failures is always part of the journey and you can't let that stop you. Um, you know, there there's points in my life where I thought, you know what, I'm ready to quit. <laughs> I'm ready to end this. I'm done. I'm over it. Um, but then I'm like, you know what, this is bigger than me. Uh, there are people out there that love what this platform is all about. There are people out there that are inspired by the words that they see on the screen when they go to blackgirlnerds.com. They're inspired by seeing young black women that are brand new to journalism, interviewing, you know, people like, you know, huge, you know, celebrities, um, and just getting these opportunities without having any experience uh, working for a studio or even necessarily going to school for journalism because um, when I hire people, I, I give them a chance. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't want to. I, I didn't want to end that. So, uh, you know, I I decided Black Girl Nerds definitely needs to stay. And uh, what I've learned from the lessons is that, or what I learned from failure is that there's always a lesson in that when you become victorious and that you become stronger as a result of it. Um, and you know, we've grown, we've become bigger and more solid and, and I'm proud of that. Um, so yeah, to any entrepreneur out there, any, or someone who's interested in entrepreneurship, um, don't let the failure stop you. Don't let uh, anything that, you know, is a setback make you feel like, oh gosh, I, I think that this is something that I shouldn't get into or I shouldn't go further because uh, that that one setback could be a setup for something even greater. Very grand, that's 100% true. Um, I do have some questions at this time. I'm gonna take some questions now from YouTube chat. 
Uh, we have one from Brittany Wilborn. What advice do you want to share with us watching in regards to getting into the industry, more specifically acting and producing? So um, Ricky, you want to touch on the producing side? What advice do you have for someone who wants Absolutely. to get into Absolutely. Yeah, I say do it, you know, do it. I came from the music industry and I said, when I realized it was going to the toilet, I said, I'm moving to film and TV. I did my research and I jumped in. I came and I said, I'm a producer. But I didn't just come in and say, I'm a producer. I had the chops to back it up. I was willing to do all the work. And no one can tell me, especially in this day and age, when, you, when we can create a project, if you feel strongly about it, you can create a project, you can get a camera, you can shoot it with your iPhone, you can grab film students around you, you can produce it and you can put it up. So you can't tell me that you can't create or produce a project. So I say, if you say you want to be a producer, then produce. Um, and also find pro people that you really love their work. No one will give up free labor, will pass up on free labor. So if you feel like I absolutely love Ava DuVernay's work, call that office, be willing to be of service. Say, I'm, I'm not looking for money. I just want to sit here at your feet and learn. I will go pick up coffee. I will go take out the trash. I will do whatever I need to do to be in that environment to, um, to show and prove. And I say, if you want to produce, produce. Get around the people that you love and respect their work and stay around them for free. They'll let you be there. That's a really good answer. Um, I have another question now from Donna. She said, I worked on movies as a casting assistant and loved it. I'm interested in becoming a casting agent. Please provide some guidelines, Leah. Okay, so first is casting director, not agent, because an agent um, is who represents the talent. Um, the casting director works closely with obviously producers and directors. I mean, we are liaisons for it, you know, between the their agents, producers, and studios. But um, first, let's just get the title right. It's um, casting director. Um, I think that if you want to make the transition from an assistant to a casting director, you're going to have to do a little more groundwork. Um, you, you should probably see if you can, um, can get in, in, in uh, with the casting director's office. Um, so you can learn a little bit more. If, if, I'm not sure who you're assisting with. Um, if you're already in a casting director's office that is allowing you to um, to go, um, but maybe if you are, that may not necessarily be the, the place to be for you if you're not more. Um, I would also suggest um, going to the Casting Society of America website. Uh, there is a... a program where they're teaching uh, assistants, um, casting assistants, for people who want to be casting assistants, um, uh, a certificate-based program where you can learn. And if you're um, a color, then uh, there's a scholarship program for you as well. So I would strongly suggest, you know, finding out if there's a casting director's office you can go into and learn a little bit more, um, and also checking out the Casting Society of America. Someone wants to know, is Leah actually casting uh, any actors right now or having any assistance so they can learn under you? Are you mentoring any anybody? Actually, I am. Um, Tamika, there's a young girl out of New York um, because we're in pandemic. She was going to move out here before the pandemic. And um, she uh, is interning. Um, she's a little paid intern, I guess. I give her what I can because we're not really in the office, but she um, she's helping out on a couple of projects that we're working on. So and she was persistent. When I tell you, she emailed me, she tagged me on um, Instagram like I, for a year, for a whole year. And I was like, I'm gonna get at you, I'm gonna get at you, I'm gonna get at you. And I said, let me just get this little girl a shot. Let me see what's going on. And she is so eager um, and so. You know, and she actually took the program, but still had a lot to learn. Um, but uh, yeah, so I do, I do mentor. I was a, another um, Felicia Henderson, who is a um, creator, uh, producer, writer, uh, introduced me to some young girls from Dallas who were out here um, and did an internship program, and they worked in our office. So it's, an, I, I think that it's very important. Um, I don't mean to jump off topic, but it's definitely important to mentor. Mentor our young black girls 
um, and allowed them to to uh, to to check out all departments in uh, entertainment industry, not just one. You know what I mean? If you're young and you can afford to get your feet wet and everything, figure out what it is you want to do. Because as much as I love casting, I that was the first thing I learned, and I just stuck with it. But I probably would have been an editor or even um, I, who knows where I would have been <laughs> had I, you know, just had the the took the time to think. Okay, maybe let me check out what else is out there in this field. They're all, you know, it's a very you can have a very rewarding and lucrative career in any behind the scenes um, uh, job in, in the entertainment industry. So I just say check out all of it. I don't know if I answered the question. <laughs> Got you. Thank you, Leah. Thank you. Connie, uh, Jason Taylor wants to know, uh, what is the difference between a producer and an executive producer? And did you have to become one first before you became the next one? Like, how? what was the process? What is the process of producing? So a producer, well, let's start with the executive producer runs everything. And then they can come in a variety of different uh, ways, like an executive producer can finance something and not really be hands-on. But if you're talking about like show running and executive producing, they run the show and hire the producers that then do more of the, I won't say day-to-day, -day, but more of the specific uh, duty. Um, I was just to, to Leah's point, like my career, I've been a PA, I've been a production coordinator, I've been a production manager, I've been a producer. I've been an EP, so I've hit on, I've been a story editor. I've hit a lot of different things. Um, and I think they all kind of go into producing and executive producing. Producers are, are troubleshooters. Like the best producers have probably gone through some of the craziest things that they had to solve for and learn from for their next gig. Um, I think those are the, that's pretty much the difference. And uh, the executive producer is their show and the producer usually works for them. Thank you. Um, I hope everybody knows the difference of producing, executive producing, and just a, a path of how to get to where you want to be. Um, this next question right here is for Jamie. This one came from Tanya. Oh, I'm sorry, no, she said for Leah. This one came from Tanya Thomas. How do you protect your project how do you go about getting casted in big screen roles as a new actor? Do you need an agent? How do you vet agents to assure it's a good fit? Okay, so the first part of the question was, how do you protect your project? Protect your project? I, I, I don't I'm know if I understand. I don't, I don't know what you Okay, so what was the second part of that question? How do you protect your project and what else can get casted? Mm -hmm. How do you get casted in big screen roles as new actors? Okay, so cast. I cast in. <laughs> <laughs> I just want you to learn the terminology if you're going to be um, in this business. Um, it, okay, so if you, first of all, training. Training is 100% hands down the most important thing. Yes, there are actors who um, have sort of Cinderella stories, if you will, that came into this business um, with the uh, raw talent. And I have helped launch quite a few careers of actors who were brand new to the business and had no training. Um, but I will say this, after they got into the business and they realized the work that they had to put into it, they're set up against some of these you know, bigger stars, they were like, oh, okay, there's a lot more that I need to learn. So I would encourage training first. Um, get as much as you can. You can never have too much training because there's always something you can learn, whether it's um, a comedy, imp improv, um, a dialect, um, movement, because believe it or not, your posture uh, uh, really... Um, determines how you're going to project certain lines. So I think that, you know, there's so many, so much you can learn um, in terms of training. I think that's first. That's it. And then the second part of that is how to, how would you be considered for a project that I am working on? I'm assuming that's what that was, um, that the first part of that question was. And mm -hmm. it, it really depends because 
if I'm looking, if I'm having an open call, then I normally will do a, um, I'll, I'll do a search. I'll put a search out like online um, or, or, or something to that effect. But if I'm looking for specifically, you know, uh, a part where it, 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 we can't really allow for like raw new talent, um, I'm going to go to the agencies. I'm going to submit, a, you know, release a breakdown. Um, and, you know, all these things, this terminology you, you'll, you'll learn as you become more, um, uh, more well versed you know, what an actor does. But uh, in terms of vetting out an agent, I don't know one agent that's going to take on an, uh, a new actor that either doesn't have credit or doesn't have some sort of formal training. So if you want to, um, if, you, if you're really actively trying to find an agent or a manager, again, I would say get your training first and then maybe you might be able to find a uh, uh, agent or a manager who's, help, who's willing to help you develop your talent and then has a relationship to get you in the doors for casting directors and producers. You all have went down a extreme journey of from, you know, being at the bottom to now the top. Did you guys ever like wanted to go to school for this or how like it was just something you fell into and you took the journey up and fell in love with it? Like, is there any training or any schooling that you think is out there or how, how would you tell somebody to go about moving from the bottom to the top? I did quit school for it. <laughs> So I, um, I, I, mean, I got my BA and my BS and I was in my first year of medical school when I met George Jackson and Doug McHenry and started doing soundtracks um, with them and came back, came to my parents and said, look, I got this opportunity, you know, Warren G and Snoop, these guys had never been outside of Long Beach. He was young kids. And um, they asked me to, you know, work on his management and take him on the road. And I thought my parents were going to go crazy. And my mom said, look, I don't know if any, if you ever have another opportunity for someone to pay you to go on the road. And if you don't like it, you know, defer your enrollment and come back home. And so I did that and I never looked back. Um, but there is school. I mean, look, you know, there's some amazing films, film schools out there that I think are, you know, incredible. Some of our greatest filmmakers have come through, um, through those programs. Um, and then there's the hands-on training, but I say, whatever it is, do your research and, you know, be knowledgeable and make sure that you have something to bring to the table. Leo, you were adding to that? Oh, no, I was just going to say that, you know, uh, you learn. So, I mean, you can go to, to school for, I guess, now that they, they have the certificate-based program for casting, I think it, it, it's as much as you might learn there, you still have to have sort of hands-on training. There's certain things that, yes, you can learn um, in, in, in class or in a workshop or anything like that, but I think hands-on training is probably the best, um, the best work experience you can get. This question came from Dem Dami. Sorry. Any advice you'll give your younger self? Not have kids. <laughs> <laughs> Connie, I to, you know, I would say to, to trust yourself and believe in yourself and and believe that, that you can do it. Um, I think when I first started in my career, it was just you just you know, I didn't have that confidence or as much confidence in myself that I could do it. So, and sometimes, you know, your your instincts are right, whether you're new at something or old or something. Um, I would just tell my younger self to to trust the process, trust yourself, and and don't be afraid to, to fail. Take risks. Ricky, anything you would tell yeah. your younger self? on a path that you took to get to where you are? Was it something like shortcut? Uh, what? No, I believe that everything that happens in my life comes from one or two places, love or fear. And I try to keep them always coming from the place of love and try to continue to check myself on it. But, you know, fear is there for a reason. When I was, you know, coming up through the industry, even at Priority Records, like we were fearless because we didn't know to be scared. But what it did was it 
opened up our minds to not have any boundaries. And I feel like we're in a place, especially now in these times, to think outside the box, to not necessarily not necessarily have boundaries when it comes to your creating. Like it, everything doesn't have to be like something else. So for me, I would tell my younger self to just continue to be fearless in everything that you do. Mm -hmm. And Jamie, I know you're the youngest one here on the panel, but anything that you would tell your younger, younger <laughs> self of how to like, maybe don't do this or do that, or just to project their career further? Uh, don't say yes to everything. Um, don't take risks. Um, well, you know, take the risk, but you know, you don't have to say yes to everything. Um, practice self-care, uh, be careful of the people that you surround yourself with, um, and just take it easy. Take it one step at a time. I think sometimes the world tells us that we need to, you know, do this thing and be this person at this age. We have to be married with you know, three kids and have a husband by this age or, you know, have this career by that age and have all of these specific goals at this time frame. And that's not true. We all have our journeys. We all have our own seasons and we're unique in that way. There's a plan for all of us and it's different and unique. So don't compare yourself to other people just because you're not where someone else is. Um, so, you know, don't be in a rush and in a hurry to get somewhere just because a friend or a colleague is somewhere, uh, I guess you would want to be, um, because maybe that's not for you. Maybe that's not your path. Maybe the thing that you thought you were supposed to be doing is not that thing. Um, so follow your passion. And that, that, that's the thing that I would have told my younger self is to just follow my passion and to have taken it easy and to have not said yes to everything. And, and yeah, all of those things. It would have been a long laundry list of things. <laughs> Leah, do you have any, uh, anything you would tell your younger self? I think these women have really summed it up. I mean, you don't, you, that when you're young, you are fearless. You really think that you can just conquer the world. So, and as you get older, you get a little more conservative in the way you, you do things. Like, oh, well, um, maybe I'm not gonna, you know, take the risk of doing that. So I think that everything that they're saying is 100% true, you know, be fearless. Um, um, you know, don't say yes to everything, have integrity and, um, and be kind, most of all. Just, you know, because yes. it's something to be kind to people. Just be kind. Be kind. It's a lost art. Uh, <laughs> the act of being kind is a lost art. This one is a very interesting question. They say, as CEOs of your company, how is it, uh, sorry, the question is, as CEOs of your company, how do you deal with one firing someone? And then what is the proper etiquette as being a boss woman of your field? Connie, would you like to go to, you know, speak on that? How do you go about that? Uh, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, can you repeat it? One asks, um, as a CEO of your company, how do you go about firing someone and proper etiquette being a boss? Like what is some of the things that you should do and shouldn't do with being a boss or executive or being in a position that you held? Okay, so, so I'm not the CEO yet. But <laughs> um, yeah, I think with firing, we have a, a, an HR team and, you know, firing is never easy. What I try to do is like, I think it's communication. And I think it's like, if somebody's doing something that isn't right or needs to be better at their job, you have to communicate that. Like, I'm not a fan of, oh, you wake up and like, oh, you know what? This person needs to go. I think you give chances and I think people don't know what they don't know and you have to tell them what you need. Um, and then if that doesn't work and you do probation and then you have to let someone go, it's you know it's just a necessary step of being in business. Um, as to proper etiquette as, you know, as an executive at a network, um, 
I don't, I mean, there's, there's so many things. Like, I think it's, it's a self-awareness. It's a listening. You have to have uh, active listening skills. Like I manage a lot of people, like, and they become, you know, you have to know what each one needs, how they communicate, you know, you have to know how to inspire people to do their best work. Um, for me, I'm a leader that likes to, you know, give a vision that everyone can buy into and they feel like they're a part of it. Um, and then that makes our team and we can execute better because everyone's invested in it. I hope I answered Ricky, that. I've you definitely did. And I want to touch on, I know Ricky has worked with, you know, Snoop Dogg and Dave Chappelle. And what is the proper etiquette when handling, you know, big talent such as them? Like what's the proper etiquette for a CEO of Magic Lemonade Productions? I think just be authentic. I mean, he, people see through the BS in a heartbeat and you know and and to be an, an active listener i think connie was absolutely right to be an active listener i mean i've learned something from every single person that i've worked with and i never say work for or they work for me i always say work with because it's always a collaborative effort and when you think of people like dave chappelle like i yes i produce dave chappelle but you don't really produce dave chappelle like i feel like it's my job to produce this everything surrounding it's my job to make sure that as his creative goes out that i'm there to understand it support it and make sure that he has a firm grant a firm ground to stand on when he steps out and so you know i get the calls at 12 30 at night and dave's like yeah i got an idea and i'm like let's go where, where are we going like he hasn't steered me wrong yet and it's been i don't know what six specials in 12 years and you know but the biggest thing is to be really clear and authentic with who i am and they know who i am they know i'm going to listen but i'm also not afraid to tell them and say i I don't get that or I don't really know if that's where we want to go. I'll give them all the reasons of what are the pros, what are the cons. And in the end, they finally make the decision. So they know that there's always a respect factor where they respect me. I respect them. And that's how we that's how we rock all the time. Leah, any any, you know, had to fire anyone was your proper etiquette and how did you, you know, go about that? Um, yeah, probably if I've, if I've let people go, it's only because I feel like in casting, you are around a lot of sensitive information. You talk a lot um, because you know a lot of backstory when you're um, working on certain projects and then high profile actors. And so when things get me a lot of times, um, you know where it comes from, especially if it's someone new on the team that may not understand that confidentiality means a lot in our, you know, in our, in our, in our field. We, learn, we know a lot about the actors. We know a lot of why, um, what things are going on on set. And so, um, so I've had to have that conversation with people about not um, talking so much. Um, I've had to, <laughs> um, I've had to, uh, People that aren't necessarily, um, I think people have an idea of what casting is uh, and come into it sometimes. It's, oh, it's just auditioning actors. And it's so much more than auditioning actors. Um, and not really understanding the responsibility. You know, we don't work uh, just like a, a regular nine to five. You know, we work very, and, and everybody in here can expect that. We work, you know, especially when you have your own company. You work 12, 14 hours a day sometimes. And so mm -hmm. um, I, I find that a lot of times people that are coming into it may not know what I expect. And I'm it's what I expect, what I do, the time that I put into it. Um, and so I expect everyone to have that same, um, you know, passion and, and, and this is what you want to do. Um, so I think... Yeah, unfortunately, had to have it. It's never really the conversation, but when you explain it to them, and I think in a logical way, people understand why it's not working out. You know, um, in terms of what was the second part? Or was that it? Uh, that was it. That was it. I wanted to. I know you. You talked about you know the time management. You know, it's not a nine to five. So I wanted to talk mm -hmm. about. What are some of your mantras or rituals that you guys do to relax, to you know, to to balance out the 
tough workload of being a CEO and having all of these. <laughs> I see you, Ricky, having all of these, you know, people look up to you and follow you and look at your direction. Like, what are some of the mantras or rituals you guys do to relax, to, you know, balance this powerful position you have? Ricky? I start every day with meditation and gratitude. I start every day. I mean, mine, not to get TMI, but in the shower, that's my time. It's that automatically. I just start off with so much gratitude from my health to my family to my career and then just set my intentions for exactly what I care, what I want this day to bring to me and then make sure that I'm open to receive even more. And so for me, I set that intention early on. And when I step into the office, well, when we used to step into the office, I would step into the office and we would go with my staff, we'd go over intentions. Like, what are your intentions for today? Like, what are we choosing today? And I did that with my kids growing up and I do that every day because to me that sets the tone and sometimes that's the only bit of time i get by myself so i have to really make the most of it jamie how do you what are some rituals or you know mantras that you do to relax i just listen and watch dave Chappelle all day and just laugh that's what i do <laughs> <laughs> um seriously i um Prayer, prayer really helps me. It, it it gets me through everything. Uh, that is the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning. That is the last thing I do before I go to bed at night. Uh, so without that, I, I cannot get through a day. Um, so yeah, that's that's what really helps me through tough times and even through good times. Um, mm -hmm. Prayer is what helps me, and just reading daily devotionals. Yeah. That is really, really good. Definitely prayer. Connie, do you do some of these same rituals or mantras? Absolutely. So prayer is the number one that I do. Um, and then something that I learned is that helps me is just, you have to disconnect sometimes. Like I used to be, you know, connected 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it gets exhausting. But I learned like, well, when we were in the office, when I came home, like for the first hour, no cell phones, no, you know, just no calls. And then, you know, I learned to expand that. And on the weekends, like you have to, like, I think in these positions, you have to make your boundaries and your time because it's so important to do self-care. Because I remember like I, in my position, I travel a lot. I'd be sick all the time because you just never recharged. And, you know, the biggest lesson I learned is like, it'll still be there. If there's a problem at one o'clock, that problem most likely will be there at two o'clock and three o'clock, and hopefully somebody else will have solved it. <laughs> um, so you just have to build in your breaks and and love on yourself and stay prayerful. Like I'm, I'm a big prayer warrior too. I think you know that is my anchor in in all the busyness and the chaos. And I know Leah has five kids over there, a whole company. What are some mantras and rituals you do to relax? I mean, it's just like all of everyone is saying, you know, prayer I think is at the forefront of all of our lives. You know, um, that is, you know, you start your day doing, what end your day doing, and sometimes in between your days, you, you know what I mean? You have to step away and, and say a little prayer so you don't hurt somebody. Um, <laughs> But um, I, but um, out that um, I I, uh, I I try to get in as much like physical activity as I can. Obviously, COVID on. You know, I, I my my dog and um, my husband. And I would take these insanely walk walks um, before the sun uh, before it gets too hot outside. And we recently just take, started bike bike riding, and I fell. Um, oh no! Yeah, yeah, yeah. I fell really hard on a bike path, um, but we've been cycling, and so that really, really helps. You know, I think just exercise in general really gets your mind free, and so yeah. So physical activity and prayer. Okay, well, I'll make sure I take in all of this. I'm, you know, I'm a student myself, <laughs> so. Um, one big question that came from Linda, what are your biggest projects that you worked on? And anybody want to explain any anything that's like, why was it your biggest project? 
Well, I want to say Dave Chappelle for Ricky, but you know, you might have another project that's in the works or something. What is the biggest project you worked on? Um, well, I, I look, we're constantly in, I've been in Ohio all summer. We're constantly in greater projects because with Dave, he raises the bar every single time. So like the stuff we have coming out ne next is incredible. Like I, I'm just, it, it's going to be breathtaking, you know? Um, so I'm really excited about that. Um, you know, every single one of the specials has upped the last one. So, you know, it's been, I, I couldn't even choose. It's like trying to pick one of your kids. Like, you know, they, they've all been really great. I'm really proud of the, um, the uh, Michelle Obama show that we're doing now, I think it's going to be amazing. And, you know, just, it's just, just really exciting. I, I'm excited. I feel like I'm just in a great place. And I'm happy with, because, you know, even the projects that weren't necessarily the most successful, they all were what I call a hand in the small of my back. They all pushed me forward in a different way. And sometimes I didn't like the process, but now I can say, thank you for the fire. Right. And you mentioned Michelle Obama, and I do know that Connie had Michelle Obama host Black Girls Rock. Was that your biggest moment in your career, or was there the Beyonce during the award show? I know you have quite a few. I mean, I, I've definitely had a career of, of big moments, and um, we honored Michelle in Black Girls Rock, and she's my best friend in my head. But, um, you know, I've been so blessed to do, like we did Love and Happiness uh, uh, when the Obamas were leaving the, the White House. We created these incredible moments on stage with different artists. Um, I think like if we look at this year, I would just say like the BET Awards was, a, was the biggest moment this year. And not only because, you know, we were in COVID, but it, the moment we were in and the message that we wanted to give. Um, I think it challenged us all as producers and executive producers to think differently. And in that thinking differently, we were able to evolve creatively. You know, that's rare. That's rare. I think sometimes we get so caught up in doing things the way we've always done things. Like it's rare to kind of be forced out of your comfort zone. But I think for anybody who's creative, it's absolutely necessary. So this year, I would say the BET Awards was the biggest. But like throughout my career, I've been so blessed. Like when I look back at the, you know, the pictures in your head, it's like I can't even believe I was there for some of those moments. It's very, very hard to believe, and we thank you for these moments because now we feel like we are a part of it as well. Uh, Jamie, I want to say Oprah Winfrey when you interviewed her was the biggest moment in your life, but you can tell me more. You could say that, yeah, I. Definitely. Oprah Winfrey, getting a chance to interview her was a huge moment. I, I would even go further back, though, when I was super green and new with Black Girl Nerds and um, when Idris Elba had followed me on Twitter and I sent him a direct message <laughs> and um, he actually responded to my direct message and I asked him, can I interview him? And he was going to Comic Con. And um, he was like, yeah, you can interview me. And he actually invited me to his hotel room and I was <laughs> able to interview him in his hotel. <laughs> um, yeah, that happened. Um, that was a great moment. I, I, I will remember that moment forever. We often confess uh, to that. You just said that. <laughs> That's a great moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But this past year, 2019 was great too, because I, I don't travel a whole lot. Like I had a, a passport with an empty canvas with no stamps on. And um, I was able to Blackbirds go to a lot of different set visits. And I went to London this past year, um, as well as junkets. So I went to London this past year, I went to Sydney, Australia. And then I went to Disney World and Disneyland, you know, in California and Florida uh, this past year for the first time at either park. Uh, so that was fun. Uh, so yeah, last year was a great year, which is great that it happened because, you know, this year, obviously, uh, travel restrictions. But um, yeah, it, it, it was been a pretty good year for BGN. So I don't want to guess on Leah. Leah has a lot of big moments over there. So can you let us know what is your biggest moment in your career? Um, 
I would probably say there were two really big moments. I think uh, the butler was really one big moment, um, only because I learned so much um, about history and things that I just didn't know in general. That I was embarrassed to say that I didn't know. Um, and so that was like, uh, something that a project really affected me um, in terms of history and research that I had to do. I was casting um, certain uh, actors and talent and stuff. So that would probably be one. And then the second one is obviously Empire because um, with Empire, it, I hadn't done primetime television in a very long time. And it was my brother's uh, introduction into television as well. So he hadn't done television ever. Um, and so it, it was a big moment for I was so nervous about being screwed up. You know what I mean? I wanted it was such a huge responsibility to um, be a part of a show that not just had, you know, Daniel attached to it, but um, uh, uh, Imagine Television. Um, Brian Grazer and uh, Danny Strong and, uh, you know, Fox. And so it was just a huge, I just remember when I had my first meeting, I made myself sick and actually had to go to the bathroom and threw up. <laughs> I was so, I was so nervous. I was like, I was like, I literally made myself sick. It was like um, watching Danny Fox, the uh, uh, movie that he did, the, bat, the football player movie, you know, Grew up in the, uh, the 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 can, and I was just like, I, I to that because I literally made myself sick worrying about whether or not I was going to be able to do this justice, and um, and I don't think any of us knew that it was going to be the hit that it, it was. I think we were just nervous about you know moving into a space that was unfamiliar, and um, but yeah, it turned out great. <laughs> You ladies have some big, big moments in you guys' career. Is there anything in your career that you look forward to having? Like anything that you you want to happen that that has not happened yet? Yeah, for me, I'm actually segueing into producing, so I'm really, really excited. I produced my first feature film last year, um, two films, um, but uh, uh, as <laughs> I was a PA, I was a rip. I was lighting. Uh, Jatasha, you know, because you were part of that process as well. So um, it was a really good experience, and um, and I'm it, making movies is fun. We have money, so I'm I'm hoping to um, to get a little more and deeply involved with that. Um, that's my career trajectory. So. Ricky, anything in your career that you want to happen, that you look forward to, that another big moment that you want to happen that hasn't happened yet? Yeah, I got two more stops on the EGOT, so uh, it, it'd be nice to <laughs> let those fall into place. Just going to lay that out there real quick to say if you say it, it'll happen. So, you know, we'll take that. But it's not the reason why we do what we do, but it's a nice little nod. <laughs> I mean, Emmy, Grammy, you have so many awards. Like, anything else we can, we can look forward to? Any other awards? I, yeah, I mean, look, the, the Oscar and the Tony, you know, we're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a, you know, a, great, a, new, a great project that I'm really excited about that we'll be announcing soon with my fellows and, you know, the 85 South guys. And I think it's going to be really different, something that we haven't seen before. So I'm really excited about that. So good stuff. And what, what's next on the train for Miss Connie? Uh, is it CEO? I heard you mention that before. <laughs> no, you know, I started my, <laughs> um, I think, you know, I started my career with my own production company. And I think that's where I'd like to end my career, going back into entrepreneurship and creating content. Um, so I look forward to, to, to that day of really like building something, you know, for my legacy. Well, you have a team here and I know we're all willing to work with each other. So definitely we, we support you and everybody in, in YouTube is definitely saying we're here, we're here, pick me. So definitely you have a team behind you. Jamie, what's next in your career? Are we, are we 
looking at anything with black girl nerds going bigger than what it's already is? That's the plan. The plan is to build it up to scale, to be a huge entertainment hub, you know, in entertainment media and online journalism. So yeah, that's really what I've, I'm working on right now. And that's essentially where I want it to be is to have a full-time staff instead of having independent contractors working for me, having a staff of writers, to having a staff of copy editors, um, to make this a full-time career for these journalists, not just me having this as a full-time career, but having it for everybody else that works for the publication. Um, so yeah, absolutely. That's <laughs> Um, it's a little technical difficulties there, but we are all here. So um, there's one big question everybody wants to know. Are you guys hiring or looking for mentors? Because everybody in the audience is definitely want to reach out and connect with you guys. So is anybody welcoming any more mentors or hiring anybody else? At the moment, I'm, I'm not. hiring. Yeah, yeah. I'm not at the moment, but I'm um, I, I always encourage people to check in because mine is obviously project based. So depending on how many projects that I'm working on, depending on it might be, um, you know, some assistance. We're and always Ricky. You said you're always hiring. Yeah, we're in the middle of five projects right now that are actively shooting, with six more in development. So we're always hiring, and I'm always looking for new voices, especially writers like. I'm really excited to see voices from new writers um, and also some people in physical production. I can always use help there. And Jamie, you were saying you're always looking for writers and- Yep, are we're you always looking for writers. Writers? I'll say that again, I'm sorry. Are you mentoring anyone as well? Any young writers that's coming up? They're looking um, for- yeah, yeah. I mean, all of the writers that come in to Black Girl Nerds um, are mentored by me. I, I definitely want to help anyone that is brand new to writing to come in. Obviously, um, the writers that come in that want to freelance, you know, paid freelancers, we want people with experience. But if you are new to writing and you want to get mentored and, and intern, then we accept those um, writers as well to, you know, create Black Girl Nerds as a space to you know, get your feet wet and get your experience on and you know, use that platform as you will. Absolutely. Great, and Connie, I know you're a big network over there, but, um, and I know you guys have internship programs, but any way that you are looking for anybody to mentor as well or, or work with anyone coming up in the industry? No, I love uh, mentoring and I encourage everyone to kind of go to uh, the Viacom CBS website there's a lot of programs uh that you can apply for uh that bring you into the industry we're not necessarily hiring right now but as soon as productions get fully back up we will be back in the market um but yes always looking for for great mentees to to help or just to to kind of give advice and you know i think it's important to share advice and in, in our journeys with people Amazing. And we're almost done with this panel, but I do want to let everybody know where they can reach you guys or follow you guys or, you know, just look up to you guys. If it's your website, is it your company or your Instagram or social media? Where can people find you guys? Leah? Um, on social media, it's at LDB Casting and my website is obviously www.ldbcasting.com. And Ricky, where can people find you? or connect with you because you are um, hiring. <laughs> on all the social media channels, um, it's magic underscore lemonade and the website is magiclemonade.com. Amazing. And Jamie, where can people find you and follow you? Yep. Um, the Black Girl Nerds Twitter is at Black Girl Nerds. My personal is at Jamie Broadnax and the website is blackgirlnerds.com. And you already mentioned, Connie, that we can go over to BET Viacom, sorry, Viacom CBS and apply, but any way that people could follow you and learn more about you? Sure, my, um, my social handle is at Connie Orlando on Instagram. And um, the website should be up soon. 
uh, ConnieOrlando.com. <laughs> we we definitely yeah, look so forward. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we definitely look forward to uh, everybody uh, in their journeys and what they're pushing forward. Um, Linda and Path wants to thank you guys so much for being here on our panel and all the questions. Uh, YouTube, thank you guys so much for following us and watching with us live, Facebook as well. Um, I definitely want to give a thank you to Babu and Asantawa for the PATH Institute and Pan-African Film Festival. And we look forward to seeing everyone next year because it's a virtual film festival in 2021. So make sure you guys follow us at PATH.org and at PATH now on all social media. Thank you guys so much for being here with this. We thank you guys so much. Thank and I'm JT. Thank you for having us.